There we go. All right, kicking off our meeting for tonight. So we did send out a survey to our distribution list to ask if people um, had any skills to share or feedback to share with us on how we could be reaching more people, how we could get more contact and engagement out there. So I wanted to share some of those answers that we got. Let me make sure I'm on the right screen here. Okay. Right, let me make this a little bigger. All right, so the question, one of the main questions that we asked was, um, there are a lot of different topics in emergency preparedness that, involve, that are involved in emergency preparedness, and there are efforts in our neighborhood needed in all of those areas. So we were asking people to indicate if they might have any experience or interest in participating in any of these specific areas um, or sharing some skills that they might have with us. Um, it looks like it's not showing the whole word here. So we only got about five responses from people, which was really, really low. We sent the survey to a lot of people, so we didn't get a ton of feedback. Um, but one of the big responses that we got was obtaining tools and preparedness supplies for neighborhood zones. Um, so we have some people that are willing to help out gathering supplies for our neighborhood. Um, we had a couple people say that they have skills to offer in grant applications or fundraising, getting money for some of those supplies. Um, also radio and communications networking and then search and assessment teams. So those were the, the highest responses that we got. Um, the other options we had on here were things like business outreach, fire mitigation, flood mitigation, um, offering how-to sessions to other neighborhoods of how to do stuff. Um, yeah, you got a question, John? Uh, there's some background noise. If, if everybody could mute, I'm hearing a lot of uh, extraneous noise uh, that's interfering with the speaking. Oh, let's see, Ed, that might be you. I'm gonna mute your microphone. So unmute, there we go, if you wanna talk to us, cool. All right. So we definitely got some input that people were interested and in, had some skills to share here, um, but we this is definitely not the reach that we were looking for to get more people involved. You know, every month we're having these meetings to try to come up with planning topics. Um, we're just trying to find where people might be interested in getting involved. Um, so does anybody have any topics that they want to share, feedback, thoughts on these initial responses here? Yeah, Jolene. Well, I'm just wondering, I think I just saw this today. Did you send the survey out prior to today? It did go out a couple of weeks ago, but it didn't make it into the River Road general newsletter. So it was just the emergency preparedness list that it went to. Okay, just not sure you know, how I missed it. Um, and do you, how big is the distribution list? Um, we have about 150 people that we reach via email. And then I think we have about 80 people in our Facebook group. There may be some overlap in the, those lists, but right. um, a good amount of people on our list. Right. So my only thought with, in terms of, I mean, so outreach is one thing and getting people involved is kind of a constant need, I think, in all community work. Um, the, just this week, because we're having some kitchen work done, I refreshed my emergency water supply and it's been a year. And I know I'm supposed to do that every six months. And I remember probably attending a meeting last year and it was like, oh yeah, I need to do that. So, um, but it occurred to me that maybe just and I, maybe you've done this, but it might just be helpful in the neighborhood newsletters, like all the neighborhood association newsletters every month to just do like tip of the month and just one thing that people could do, like one simple thing. And um, I will say also that in our work with the social justice committee in River Road, we kind of constantly have to remind ourselves that 
we can't do everything, but we can do something. And I think with this topic, it's enormous. So just in terms of maybe, and you've been really great at creating educational programs with focus, but I would say maybe looking at one point of focus for a, a certain amount of time and hammering on that might, I mean, hammering isn't the right word, but, you know, yeah. just uh, like for the fall, you know, fall emergency prep and here are, you know, three things you can do and then repeat those every month for three or four months. I, I don't know, that's just an idea. Um, and I would also, so I'll, I'm also looking at this and just reflecting on the disaster in Eastern Kentucky right now and thinking about where would people gather if they needed to gather someplace. And I am looking at religious organization outreach and thinking we have quite a few large church buildings and communities in our neighborhoods, both in River Road and Santa Clara, maybe also in Bethel. Um, frequently with a fair amount of land surrounding them. And it seems like, gosh, that would be a really, and the schools also, you know, both of those in terms of thinking, where would people go in, in the event of an emergency where they needed to seek shelter, for instance, or to find community resources and services. And so I know that there's an emphasis on you know, becoming acquainted with your neighbors and that all has great value. But it seems like those two components might be super important if we were faced with a true natural disaster of some kind. That's just all off the top of my head, so. Yeah, perfect. No, yeah, this is great conversation, appreciate it. Okay. Um, I think Ed, you had your hand up also. One one thing I think of I think is that the what makes people really conscious about disasters and being prepared is when they have a disaster, and then and then a lot of times afterwards they're really interested in being prepared for disasters. Um, in in Eastern Oregon, where I used to live, there was a a, um, a you know a forest fire that threatened the it, well, it, it threatened a lot of houses and, um, and, and scared people a lot. And, um, and then after that, that uh, part of the county was able to uh, have a referendum and install a, a local you know, taxpayer funded fire department that could handle, that could, you know, could provide emergency uh, services within a certain area of the county that had been affected by the fire. And so and that fire department's still there, and so that it's just that's an example of, of of you know people being, and so like here when we had the in 2020 when we had the forest fires that were close to, that got close to Eugene, then I think there were quite a few people who were more inter who were pretty interested in preparedness, but I think that's kind of when like I mean people in my family who were prepared who were interested in preparedness, but now that has, uh, they're less interested, I guess you'd say, because there hasn't been an immediate threat. So that's kind of, that's my two cents worth, I guess. Oh, the other thing is, I think it's good. I think it would be, I think it's, I, I keep going, I kind of go back to the map your neighborhood idea and just like the people, kind of the most people that I know that aren't family members or friends are my neighbors and uh, that I see fairly often. And uh, I haven't really, I haven't really gone out, gone after any of them for uh, preparedness, but uh, I, I keep thinking that maybe I'll start doing that this year. So that's all. Thanks, Ed. Um, let's see. I thought I saw another raised hand, Charlesy. Yeah. Um, well, a couple of thoughts came to mind when uh, Jolene was making her uh, suggestion that we might want to focus on um, where people would um, would go in, in an emergency. 
it occurred to me that maybe Andy Davis, who's in on this call as head of the CERT program, would have some comments to make about that. What if if there were a, a citywide emergency? How is the CERT program handling that with their partners? And also, um, I wanted to just point out that to piggyback on what Ed was saying about if the immediacy of an emergency feels uh, very pressing, people tend to perk up. And one of the things we're talking about is in November having a presentation um, with the River Road uh, general meeting on dam safety and the potential risk of flooding, which I think is a topic that is going to capture people's interest. Um, maybe many people who aren't aware that we do face that risk here in Eugene. And um, and the third thing I wanted to say is we had a really good day a couple of months back when we went to the Aubrey uh, Park um, Wildflower Festival, and we had a booth there, and a lot of people came up to us. Um, uh, Bethel neighborhood subsequently had, I think, six um, similar kind of uh, booth events in Bethel, but we haven't done that in River Road. And I really think it's a way of having informal but meaningful conversations with people where they can share what they're doing and what their concerns are. And I would hope that maybe we could put more of a, a in-person presence out there more, but frankly, we do need help with that. There are just a few of us doing a lot of work and um, I'm not sure the best way to approach that, but um, I think that's a one idea that makes a difference. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, had a point. One of the things that in piggybacking off of what Charles says is that, you know, one of the things we should maybe look at is what events are going on in our neighborhoods in, you know, like the Aubrey Park one, or I know River Road Park has some events throughout the summer and maybe we could piggyback and guess just because starting up a whole new event is hard because you don't, people aren't used to it, but if there's an event that's already going on and it attracts a lot of people maybe we can just ask if we can get a table there just so we can have an informational booth type of a thing i don't know and maybe maybe do like we did with bethel and we could get some way of attracting people to the to the booth too you know once we're there but that was just my thinking about that as far as how we get involved with events or at events where there's a lot of people. Well, um, what comes to mind, although I haven't been able to free up time to do it yet this year, is the um, Emerald Park music events. People are there to hear music. But if we did have a table just off to the side, there might be people who would wander by and be interested in just picking up some of our literature which we have a lot of copies of now, by the way. <laughs> we have a lot of copies. So, um, you know, I would do it with somebody else I um, to just be there and maybe five people only would, would have conversations or maybe there'd be 15 or 20. Um, those events uh, draw a lot of people. Yeah, Ed. Oh, well, yeah, I, I, I went to, I think, five uh, park events in Bethel, the Bethel neighborhood, and a couple of them, it like rained the whole time. But um, I, I, after sitting there for a few, you know, through these events, I found that, you know, it, you kind of have to uh, engage people as they walk by and, um, and and pe people, you know, sometimes people would, would will be willing to talk. And also, we had, I think, at the the wildflower event, we had a 
an auction. Was was didn't we have an auction at the wild? Yep, we had the raffle there. The, the raffle, raffle, yeah. And that uh, <laughs> and, and and so people people stayed at the event so that they'd be we we did the raffle right at the end. And mm -hmm. people stayed at the event and came to the raffle and they were just clustered around, <laughs> you know, and it, it was great, you know. And then at, at a couple of the other events, we we had we had raffles, but we it was like uh, it was like we the raffle would be people put in their raffle tickets, but but then uh, the the raff then the raffle was not held at the end of the event. It was like it was held like oh like the next day, and and then people were notified by email, and on that one, um, you know. We, you know, we drew the names, and I, I emailed the people who won the raffle, and nobody, and they, and they asked them when they wanted me to deliver their prizes, but none of them replied back. You know, they, it's like, it's like, when you have that in-person raffle, there's a lot of excitement, but then, if there's not in-person, it's like people don't have time for it. Sort of, was my take on that. I think there's, you know, there's devices. Yeah, just another device for your attracting people is, you know, when like people with children walk by, you know, I I yell out sometimes, "Do you like fossils?" <laughs> and um, and so and sometimes they perk up and say, "Yeah, I like fossils." So I had a, I have an ammonoid fossil. You know, it's like a, it's a kind of, it's like a, a chambered nautilus fossil. It's about about half, you know, it's about this big. And I just hold it up, you know, and the, the people, and it, but it's, it looks pretty cool. I mean, it's not real cool. But, and people just like go, you're like, oh, wow, a fo is that a real fossil? You know, and, and so you can start talking about fossils and then you know, go to emergency preparedness. And this poor, this poor chambered Nautilus. The old bait and switch. <laughs> yeah, was not able to survive a, a sandstorm that fell on it, you know. And we have sandstorms here in anyway, so. Yeah, bait and switch, exactly. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Don? Yeah, uh, Jolene really keyed off a lot of thoughts in my head. Very good suggestions. And I think uh, the way to get people involved is to approach them in many different ways. Uh, one way is to establish meeting places where people would go uh, in a disaster to get information that they're maybe not getting on the radio or, or by other means. Uh, and so having those established and letting people know uh, somebody's looking out for you, uh, if you're interested, here's where you would go to get more information. That could be very valuable. Uh, the second thought is that uh, some of the things that Andy has planned, like the drills and so forth, I would like to make those more visible because uh, when neighbors see a group of people walking down the street dressed funny in these green vests or whatever and hard hats, they're going to wonder what's going on and maybe get interested to see what we're up to. And maybe that's a way to attract people uh, to the cause and uh, have them think about, oh, these guys are, are getting prepared. Maybe I should do that too. And, uh, you know, it's just little subtle things like that we can do. The information booths are great. Uh, they allow people to come up and ask questions, but uh, maybe demonstrating out in the community more with the drills and so forth and being visible might help them be more attracted to the booth later. Like, what are these guys doing? What are they up to? And, uh, so thank you, Jolene. That was some great, great uh, suggestions. Yeah, there's definitely an element of advertising and kind of psychology to it, right? To make people interested in these topics and everybody knows they need to do it, just like you know you need the exercise, but how do you motivate people to actually get it done? Uh, Charles, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, Jackie, when the heat uh, dies down just a bit. If we might not use the canopy and do some a booth over, say, um, at grocery outlet, buy mart, 
area and just um, spend several hours on a weekend uh, just trying that out. I I'd like to see it in River Road, frankly. I think Bethel has demonstrated they really have their act together. Um, and um, I, I, I saw the comment in the chat about Jerry's. I've heard great things about the work that the certs do at Jerry's, but I'd really like to see something in River Road um, where we have a chance of connecting with our, our, well, a better chance of connecting with the residents here um, and maybe just striking up those informal conversations and inviting them to attend these meetings. But we got a lot, we got something like 36 new people at Aubrey um, sign up. It was, it was quite wonderful. I yeah, those in-person events were definitely effective. I think it's trying to find the manpower to staff yeah. those tabling events. Um, well, if, they, if we, yeah, yeah, Go I was going to say, if we know when they are, maybe, you know, we can put the question out to say specifically, we need help on this day to come show up and help be at the table. Yeah. pass out information that might be more helpful. Right. And maybe do some targeting requests of people from River Road, for instance, or maybe that Joel knows from Santa Clara who have expressed some interest along the way. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I was missing the items in the chat. I apologize there. Dandy, uh, Andy, I did see your comment about uh, developing damage assessment teams. I saw that on our survey as well. Um, is that something you can tell us a little bit more, tell the group a little bit more about? Uh, sure. Thank you, Jackie. Um, that is a new initiative for the CERT program for this year. Uh, last year and probably the year before that, uh, Don and myself, we, uh, we, the initiative was to start the uh, emergency communication network for Eugene uh, uh, and get solicit some uh, ham radio operators to volunteer to cover the different neighborhoods throughout the city. So this year we want to uh, have certs and non-certs, not just certs, but non-certs, uh, where they live to develop uh, damage assessment teams. It's usually made up of three people, uh, two people to walk together as they walk the street survey after a major disaster and a radio team leader that would have an FRS radio. And so the ones that do the survey would tell the radio team leader and they could write it down when they get back or write it as they're walking of what damages they see in their neighborhood. They don't have to go blocks, just walk around the street. Hopefully we will have mobile damage assessment teams throughout say River Road area, Santa Clara area, uh, and they would come back to the radio team leader and say, here's what we found. And then that radio team leader would pass that information on using the FRS radio to a neighbor, which in turn would pass it to the Northwest District Net Control. And then that, and then that person passes it on to the Eugene Emergency Operations Center. So that's our new initiative for this year. Try and probably next year uh, is try to encourage uh, 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 neighborhood uh, associations uh, to encourage their uh, neighbors to uh, to develop these teams, uh, and we would use these teams in the exercises that Don was talking about earlier. We're having the exercise September 24th, which is a Saturday from 10 till noon. And then we will have another exercise on October the 29th from 10 to noon. Both of these exercises are using the uh, damage assessment teams and ham radio operators uh, just to see how they go. I know you guys can hear all my clocks going off, letting you know it is seven o'clock. <laughs> so that's the initiative about the damage assessment teams. Uh, so, uh, and I was thinking about Jerry's, uh, Jerry, which is good is if they provide the tent, the table and the chairs, you just have to show up and, and talk to the people. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an option. Um, I know you were talking earlier about an emergency where, where would you would go? I've heard some uh, 
Navy term we call scuttlebutt. I've heard a term where that uh, possibility that um, uh, Riviera Baptist Church is is looking into about being a, a emergency uh, type shelter on River Road. Um, I think they're going to be working with, um, I think it's a Southern Baptist Convention, which disaster, uh, they have a disaster team. And so I think they, they're kind of working with that. So I'm not sure how far along they are with that, but that's a, that's a, that's a promising, uh, promising idea there. They have quite a bit of uh, property there uh, on their, uh, their land in the front and in the back. Uh, so that's an option. So I, I, I'll, I'll try to keep checking back with, with them to find out, you know, you know, how they're doing or how long, far along they're going or is it just talk or are they actually moving in that direction. So, but anyway, so that's Santa Clara. Uh, uh, and so, uh, and I agree that, you know, it'd be good to get something in the river road area. Um, and that's a good idea. Check with by Mart and say, hey, can we, uh, can we put a table out here? Uh, you know, Girl Scouts, they're always out there selling the cookies. I don't see why you guys can't get out there and say, hey, how about this? So uh, I hope that answers your question, Jackie, on, on the damage assessment teams. Yeah, that's helpful. And I got September 24th and October 29th. Are those the dates? Yes. Okay. The 24th, uh, basically, uh, we will plant if you're you have to let me know if you have a neighborhood or damage assessment team that wants to play, let me know. And uh, we will have uh, on the 24th, we will actually uh, have envelopes. They're yellow and it says cert. And inside those envelopes will be a filled out damage assessment form. So basically the team will go like on a scavenger hunt. And as they walk, they'll say, ah, and they'll see this bright yellow envelope. They'll pick it up. And they'll take that damage assessment form back to the radio team leader. And then the radio team leader will radio, radio in that information and, and go all, all the way up to the chain. On October 29th, there will not be a damage assessment form in the envelope. There will be a picture of something damaged. So that damage assessment team will open up the envelope and they'll look at this picture. So now they got to describe what they see on the picture to the radio team leader and send it back so that's the, that's how the two scenarios work but i have to know where we need to send the envelopes or who's playing awesome i definitely think that's something we could get together to send out a request in the neighborhoods to see if anybody's willing to participate and andy we can connect with you to to get that information yeah uh, or jerry, to, to yeah, get that jerry, coordinated yeah jerry brown is the santa Clara net control and there are a couple of there. Uh, he has a few uh, ham radios in Santa Clara. Um, River Row, we, ha we have uh, Matt Anderson uh, as a ham radio operator, and he lives off of Maxwell Road area. Uh, and that's all we have for River Road. And I would encourage your organization in Santa Clara to ask your neighbors that are there, uh, please, we need hand volunteers to help our neighborhoods. Uh, so, yep. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Now that we have some dates for some exercises planned, I think we can probably spend some time kind of segre not segregating, splitting up our neighborhood into different sections um, and saying we need people from these different areas to, to participate, to just try to get people involved in all the different areas. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Andy. All right, next hands up, I see Jolene. I'll let Thea go next because she hasn't spoken yet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute, Thea. I'm, one of the first things I wanted to say was apologizing to Jolene. I missed her, uh, her comments. Uh, and then um, thanking Andy for uh, more information on the DAT exercises. I'm really looking forward to that. And that uh, is really interesting. It's a good plan, I think, to divide up into areas and see who might be willing to, um, you know, sign up from an area that way. And the other comment was uh, the uh, thinking of Bymart uh, having a flyer or something that shows the, the type of uh, uh, bug out gear that might be actually purchased in Bymart. Uh, and showing that to them when you walk in and ask for a table. 
<laughs> might uh, might be useful. I don't know. I haven't tried that myself, but they do have an awful lot there if you uh, are careful of which um, uh, two-way radios you purchase there. Oh, we have not always found FRSs there, just ones that they say are FRS, but are actually GMRS. So that's something to be aware of. And um, one thing that we have used a lot in Friendly, I'm coming from Friendly area here, is uh, Next Door has been really helpful for us to post things on or recruit from. I don't know if that was mentioned, so I'm just throwing that in. Thank you, great ideas. Thanks, Via. Jolene? Yeah, so I, I think this idea about having a table at Weimart is coalescing around a really good nugget. Honestly, that's a great idea in terms of um, sort of in a sideways kind of way promoting services or products that a local business might have to offer. I just, I wanted to reflect a little bit on Ed's comment about how people get really interested after something happens to them um, or maybe some, somebody close to them. And I was reflecting on listening to a news report about the flooding in East Kentucky and someone who was frustrated with um, what they perceived to be um, an inadequate FEMA response and the interview with the I don't know what federal representative who was on the ground and <clears throat> said he's been on the ground through tornadoes and now the flooding. I mean, basically, he said, we're doing as much as we can. And, you know, these people are digging out from a flood and then another flood comes through and they have to dig out again. So connecting that with what Ed said, I think, and I, I don't think this is morbid or schadenfreude-ish, but if we can say, what can we learn from, you know, other people across the country who are dealing with flood or fire, you know, what, what kinds of things have come up for them? I think maybe if you can point to some specific kinds of events and community response or individual response, it also helps people think a little more concretely about what that might look like here. So when you, for instance, mentioned the dams and flooding, you know, that just made me think about like schools and what do we do if we have to dig out kind of thing, you know, who has that kind of equipment. And so um, I, I just think in terms of um, like monthly information, just linking it to what's happening around the country and also what's happened in our own state for sure. Um, and again, like Bymart, I think that's great. You know, maybe something at Emerald Park, again, with a smaller group, keeping a focus. If you just have a few people who are able to help out, you know, I think that's a, a way to feel more successful. I love the idea of the damage assessment teams. I can tell you that if people in my neighborhood saw people walking around in bright green vest with yellow hats or what and clipboards they would be asking questions and talking about it for for weeks probably so anyway that's all thanks great points jolene all right other thoughts from anybody Let me double check back to our, there was a space for some open comments in this survey. Let me double check there. Um, so we had development of damage assessment teams and volunteer ham radio operators. So we're always looking for radio operators. Um, there was an item of a time bank submitted here. And John Q, I know you're here with us tonight. I know that there was an email that came through about a time bank, but I have honestly not caught up on what all of that means. So if that's something that you wanna talk about and give us an overview. Yeah, Bianca Bell uh, is from Southeast Neighbors, and she now works with Lane County Emergency Management. And a few years back, she, uh, I think she has a master's in emergency management, and she brought uh, some materials from one of the, the classes that she had just taken, and they were talking about uh, nine point something earthquakes around the world. So as Jolene was just saying, tying uh, preparedness to events that are occurring elsewhere just than just here. 
So Christchurch, New Zealand uh, had a, a nine something and then a big aftershock a few months, I think three, three to five months later. And uh, a researcher there found that this one community called Littleton uh, near Christchurch seemed to be more resilient than the others. And, and when she looked closely, it was they had this community institution called a time bank. And uh, there's a, a whole thing about time banks. There's some books, uh, a Bobby Kennedy speechwriter uh, ran with that idea, I think in the eighties and they had a lot of success um, in elder care in Florida. They got a lot of money. I think the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded a lot of that. And his name was Edgar, Edgar S. Kahn and he just barely passed away earlier this year. Uh, he was a really uh, interesting visionary guy. He and his wife also founded a free uh, legal uh, school, College of Law, where all of the participants um, participated in actual cases of pro bono uh, serving the poor. But the, the time bank was this concept uh, that everyone has value, everyone has something to give. Uh, and they, they said, if you do a favor for a neighbor, you uh, drive their kids to school or you mow the lawn or you clean the debris out of the gutter or you help trim back, you do a, f a wildfire danger assessment, any, anything, you go to the neighborhood meeting, um, you can get credit in the time bank. And then as you build up all these different members offering different services, uh, then you can spend your time dollars on other services all throughout the neighborhood and develop a rich network. And what comes out of that are, are the exact same outcomes that we want from the Map Your Neighborhood program, which are uh, interconnection between nearby neighbors, knowing what skills people have, uh, finding out what resources are available nearby. So it's another path to those same goals for, for those neighbors of ours who aren't quite as interested in, in the preparedness side, but have other interests. And, and the time bank really opens it up to, to everything. There's two time banks in Eugene, you can go online and find them. And I'll pop some links in. The Lane Services Sharing Network uh, has a lot of members. You can see what services they offer. And then because that one was fee oriented and you had to pay more as you got more members, we looked at that early on and said, we can't scale that out to the, the number of people that we want to be using this. So we went with a free service out of Portland, Maine and it's been fine for the last couple of years. Uh, we've used it mostly for recording time only against the neighborhood association against our uh, disaster preparedness. So all the drills we do, we record it in the time bank. And then the time bank, you can run regular reports to get this stuff out. So um, for us, it's, it's a, a way of sustaining and building the program and um, uh, bringing new people in always. And it, it's just another path, another way of expanding our outreach. Uh, any John. questions about that? Yeah. I'll pop those links into the, the chat, but what we're, what we've done is um, Bianca introduced the idea. We did some research, partnered up with the existing time bank, did our own also, have run it for a couple of years, and now we're negotiating to get a physical branch office. The big study the woman did in Littleton uh, also looked at obstacles to people adopting it. And one of them was people are reluctant to uh, spend for services if they don't already have an account. They feel like they need to earn, earn their money first. So uh, the way that we sought to overcome that is we're gonna approach all the neighborhoods. We're, we're drafting a letter, it's out for the, the last review and offers since all of the neighborhoods just did their reporting for the city 
did that 12 or 18 month uh, accounting time. Set up accounts for all your people. Now that start with, and uh, we'll have a branch office. We can meet with people. It says my internet's unstable, so I'm going to shut my picture off and finish up. But we thought that uh, that would be one way to to really build the organization and uh, have this outreach where each of the disaster preparedness communities uh, in the neighborhoods, this would not be centralized because we want these face-to-face -face relationships. We would want to have um, coordinators in each area. So Ready Northwest might have a, a time bank coordinator who meets regularly or has some regular hours available for appointment, some way to have that face-to-face -face. because a lot of people do not want to participate on the internet. We don't want to be liable for their information. So if we can keep all of their personal information offline, have some numbered account, only the time banker in that neighborhood knows that person, knows and can link that to the account. It's it's nowhere where the information can be stolen. That that's important to a lot of people. So we're offering that option as well. It's also online now, 24/7. Uh, so uh, yeah, Don Don, did I leave anything out? No, I don't think so, John. Uh, yeah, I've used it to record a lot of my hours. Uh, never thought about getting anything back, though. But now that you mentioned it, if somebody's offering, like, to clean up my yard or something, I would, <laughs> I would like to do that. I would like to uh, spend some money, uh, so to speak. Uh, so that would uh, also get me to, to, to get to know the per person that comes over to do the work, too. So I, I like the idea, you know. I got a question, John. Uh, okay. I, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you probably thought of this, but I have to ask, have you thought of um, going into with the tool bank, uh, the toolbox project? Uh, they have an, an office and hours already. And uh, it may not be that centrally located for um, Northwest. It's, uh, I think, around 22nd and Friendly Street. But uh, it's already established, and, and uh, they might have enough room. And so I was curious. That's a great idea. Yeah, I would, I would say that'd be the uh, ideal location for the friendly branch office of the time oh. bank. <laughs> well, the, the tool okay, the, the toolbox project does serve the whole community. It is definitely all community, although a lot of people don't realize that. And uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, I, I joined the first UG nonprofit uh, time bank and uh, a couple of years ago and, and listed a lot of my resources available. And then after more people join and I realized I didn't really know them like I knew the others, I started uh, um, taking, you know, deleting things that like, you know, generators and big ticket items because I don't know that your address, it's not listed until you offer something or that you want to meet with somebody. Uh, so, but still people can find your address. So um, that's a concern, but you can st definitely offer services, but maybe just be aware uh, if you're putting out, uh, you know, actual physical items, just what you might, um, you know, want to be vulnerable to it. I'm sorry, I just had to say that. No, that's it. That has been a concern that we found in our pilot. And that's why we're offering the in-person, uh, non-internet, no information on the internet option. So none of that personal information can be seen by anyone, even if you make a mistake uh, on the online account. There's nothing that'll be out there to reveal if you, if you hit the wrong button. It'll all be in the branch office. Super important. Did, did you want me to call on people, Jackie, or you're? Um, yeah, so I thought Jolene, your hand was up next. I just had a quick question. How big is the Littleton community where the research was done initially in New Zealand? I don't 
Here we lose John. That's for you, John. Yeah, I'm Googling it now. So <laughs> I'm Googling it in the background here. I figured oh, that. I'm sorry. I, I'm I was just, typing away. No, and it, it seems like a small town kind of thing. So I'm just curious, like, you know, what's the scalability of it? I And, you know, given privacy concerns, et cetera. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. And Littleton is, uh, it says, a little over 3,000. So our, our comparison was between uh, the Littleton area and each neighborhood. So right. each neighborhood would have that, that, that sense. Sure. Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, Charlesy? You're on mute. Yeah, to unmute. On the banking thing, I've heard it described a couple of times, and I guess I'm a graphic visual person. What would really help in marketing it to me is actually having some um, video of how that might work. I mean, how how people pay into it or or contribute to it, and how examples of how people might borrow against it. I mean, how it functions rather than just words which is doesn't give it dimension to me. The other is um, I'm intrigued by what Thea said about the toolbox program, because I was actually uh, involved in some of the discussions around that um, last year. And seems like it was like five years ago, but it was last year. And for Thea to point out that that's a community-wide thing, I remember that being one of the points that was driven home was that initially those tools that were purchased with, with grant funds would be available to the South Hills to help clean out uh, overgrown uh, brush and so on to reduce the risk of fire. Um, and that also in time, they would be available, those same tools would be available to other places because I mean, even River Road has properties that people, if they had the right tools, might take care of some of the backyard um, overgrowth and so on. So how do we go about finding out more about that? And Jackie, maybe this is something that we should put in the River Road newsletter and that you might also have um, for distribution information of, for distribution to our um, people um, in the database as to if they need tools, how can they borrow them? If that's, if I'm getting it right, if I'm correct in my assumption. Don, can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, the tools became available and we plan to put them in uh, the toolbox, uh, the tool loaning program, but they didn't have room for everything because uh, right. some of the tools take a lot of room and like they were they talked about oh we're gonna have to double the size of our shed you know it became in, untenable and so the tools are there uh they're available when somebody wants to use them but it's difficult because you have to uh contact me or contact david monk or somebody that knows where they are uh to get them that's not should not be a uh, a big obstacle because somebody they could go to a, a central person in your neighborhood say I need these tools and you could say okay I'll arrange it and you make a call and it's not that big a deal but uh, yeah it, there's a little bit of a hiccup in in trying to implement this and that we couldn't put them in the, the tool shed type thing. Is there an inventory of what tools are available that we could put together as some kind of uh, information piece to say these tools avail are available in the community? Um, I mean, we would need some idea as to what we're, we're suggesting people have access to if they... Yeah, and I, I'll give you something off the top of my head. There's... Okay. There, there's gloves, hard hats, uh, 
some pole saws, which are very good. And those are something you don't want to buy yourself. Some bow saws to, to saw up limbs and stuff. Uh, those are probably the main tools we have that people would want to borrow uh, that they wouldn't have themselves. Uh, and just the safety, uh, safety glasses, hard hats and gloves are a good thing to have if you start doing a project like that. So, right. yeah. Are, are those actually being checked out? Is it being used? Have people taken advantage we, of those tools? We have not done that or we've not had a lot of demand mm -hmm. for it yet because we haven't publicized it. Right. Because we didn't, it was supposed to all be set up in the tool shed and yeah. didn't get done. Yeah. Okay. John, did you have uh, some more yeah. information? Of course, John has some more information. <laughs> oh my God. These are the, um, this is the um, other time bank, not the one that we ran, but it, uh, it shows. Uh, Lane Services Sharing Network, and I'm logged in, so you can go look at what people are asking, what kinds of services, and uh, need help with the front and backyard. So, Don, there, they got your idea already. Mm -hmm. um, I, iPhone and MacBook, so they're looking for somebody with some Apple computing experience. Oh, neighborhood news reporters, if anyone <laughs> wants to uh, cover your local committee meetings and do a write-up for us, sort of like Carlene Riley for every committee in the city. That's what we're, we're going for. Weeding, small bicycle welding, there, that's a specialized. Uh, be a pollinator. You can see there's a really wide variety of uh, things that people are, are requesting. Let's see what they're offering also. So these are the gifts that people uh, can help you with, proofreading and editing help, teaching Mandarin, uh, eggs, backyard chickens, transportation to do errands, uh, editing and proofreading, furniture tools and other household goods. Wow, I gotta check that one out. Uh, disaster recovery, a master of disaster, Thomas Price is on here I see. Marketing, dog walking, um, you can go visit these. And we have uh, also beyond our emergency folks, others joined our, our uh, time bank and they got involved. I just wanted to show you, we have a little write up about the whole thing. And there's a link to Lucy's talk. Lucy Ozan is the uh, TED talk, TEDx talk presenter. I got to get past the ad here. Can anybody hear that? We can't, John, and we're coming up oh, okay. on about one minute left tonight. So I think uh, I know you've shared some more information here. So I think we need to get that shared a little more widely mm -hmm. um, and get this idea talked about a little bit more. I think it's a really cool concept. So thanks mm -hmm. for giving us that overview. Awesome. Uh, Thea, one more last comment here. Uh, there are some videos available for the uh, first nonprofit the, through the Hours Network uh, owner type. If, if you go and look for them, they're there. Yeah. This has been great. Yeah, really helpful conversation tonight, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining and sharing out. This is really helpful to just bounce ideas off of each other. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Well, that it puts us at 7.30 right at time. So we're going to end for tonight and we'll Thank see you, you everyone. next month. Thanks all. All right. Bye now.